All right, it's uh, 603 and the Conservation Commission meeting will come to order. Uh, the first order of business is uh, the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Any comments or corrections? Yeah, there's a motion to accept the minutes as written. For a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Abstain. Uh, aye. Mr. Collins? Did you vote? Oh, yes, I did. I accepted it. Oh, okay, that's right. Yeah. You did. Uh, okay, so the minutes are accepted. Next, we have a, a resident who is concerned about a safety issue at a uh, conservation subdivision. And it's not on the agenda, but it should be a relatively short discussion. And I'm hoping that maybe we can vote to suspend the, the rules and, uh, and address that where the, um, uh, normally the permit applications would go. I'll make a motion to suspend the rules. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, there's no public comment, so why don't you come up and tell us your name and your address. I'm sorry, could you spell your last name, please? Yeah, I see the green light. Okay. So Ralph Losey, L-O-S-E-E, -E, in townhomes at Green Ridge. Um, the developer, uh, uh, there's a pond in the middle of our, we're a horseshoe, and there's a pond out in the green, in the area there. Um, and it's it's very nice. And over the course of the last four years since it was built, uh, the reeds and grasses and whatever are continuing to grow up around it. Uh, aesthetically, it would be nice if we could continue to see the pond because last year the the reeds were probably up five or six feet uh, all the way, and it goes all the way around it. Uh, that would be nice, but that's not uh, what really the primary concern at this point. I was explaining to, I'll say Scott because I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that's his fine. last name. Um, last year, we're not a closed community. Uh, there are some children who live in our community. My grandchildren live with me part-time. Uh, but there are children who live directly behind us and in a couple of houses on either side of us. And they do come into the neighborhood to play with the kids in our neighborhood or just come into our neighborhood from time to time. And last summer at one point, towards the end of the summer, a seven or eight year old boy from the back neighborhood was in with his sister and they were out playing. We weren't all paying attention to what was going on. It's, you know, it's out in front of us. But uh, apparently at some point he rode his bicycle through the reeds, um, maybe not realizing that there was a pond there and rode right into it. His sister got upset and, and yelled and you know we got him out. He wasn't hurt. He got wet. His bicycle got wet and everything was fine. But it, it's a concern of ours that, I mean, we to a certain extent can control. I can sort of control my grandchildren to a point uh, and you know tell them they know it's out there and be careful about it. But that is somewhat of an issue to us. So uh, what the HOA board uh, I offered and they asked me to come and start this here. What, if anything, can we do to maintain that situation out there? Uh, is it possible for us to, we don't want to rip the stuff out that's there, but would it be possible for us to cut it down maybe once a season and, and just lower the height of it? So we can have a bit, not like right down to the ground, but if it's up five or six feet, if we could cut it in half, something like that, would would that be something that we could have our landscaper do or 
potentially go out and do ourselves just so that something like this potentially wouldn't happen again and that's I'm just looking for some direction at this point as to what we can or can't do so to, to frame this um, are you all familiar, familiar with where the uh, pond is located in the community yeah, I, I do have a, if you want to pass this around, I have yeah, be great. Do you have the, the vegetation that's a concern to go all the way around the pond? Yes, it does. You can, it's harder to see in this because it is oh, a fairly yeah, high shot, gotcha. but it does go yep. all the way around. Yep. So was the pond, and Scott, maybe you know this, was the pond created when the development went in, or was that there already? Yes, yeah, it was a conservation subdivision. Um, there, was, there was some wetland incursion, um, and this was done to mitigate that. Okay. Um, so the vegetation is somewhat natural then because of the... Yeah, the veg... Well, Right, it's wetland, right? So the vegetation is desired. Um, we, you know, we'd be looking to strike a balance here between safety and habitat, and um, you know, wetland conservation. The the developer told me that in the center of the pond, it's he said it's close to eight feet deep there. Which I mean, we're not going to have anybody swimming in it, but that's certainly well deep enough for something bad mm -hmm. to happen. So the way the houses are located, it looks like um, the majority of houses would have a view of the pond if the vegetation on that side was cut, but not on the back side. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, that's appropriate? true. Yeah. I mean, the, the circle is a paved road around three quarters of it, and then there's the dirt uh, section across the back. The fire department wanted to have be able to drive around in a circle if necessary. Is there anything in the um, HOA documentation when that was filed around maintenance of this area or around vegetation on the site in general? I know it, this wouldn't be covered under the landscaping that was put in, but I thought there was supposed to be a maintenance plan in those docks. We, we do have a, a, a landscaper who comes and mows the lawn mm -hmm. and maintains the rest of the property, but they Don't specifically... We specifically last year, they said, you know, we could go out and do something there, but we specifically told them not to because we, um, I've dealt, I've dealt with uh, conservation commissions before when I lived in Meredith, and and I know what you can and can't do, uh, so we specifically said don't do anything. We'll go through this season, and now we're coming to the board to to see if there is anything that we can do. Can I ask if you've like? It, it, if your landscaper or your community group have have you discussed various treatments so do you have like treatment options in mind for that area that you could let us in on the only thing that we have talked about at this point is potentially having our landscaper or some of us ourselves just go out with you know clippers and and uh, you know, and waiters, <laughs> right? That's and, what I was wondering. And, and go in and cut it down. That's that's the only thing we've talked about at all. Cut it down in terms of cut it down in height. Yeah, just cut it down. No, we're not talking. We're not talking about cutting it all the way down or ripping it out or whatever. We're fine with with having the natural look out there. It's just that as, as it has, you know, we're four years. The community's four years in now, and and every year, especially last year, was as wet as it was. Uh, it just got so tall that uh, it sort of it's become an issue a little bit. We, we probably like not to cut it, cut it all shorter because the seed heads are uh, important for the the wildlife. Um, the one thing that we probably should consider is that we should pull up the plan before making any definitive recommendations. So we can talk about it preliminarily here, um, but then pull up the plan and maybe come back. I'm fine with that, absolutely. Uh, this, like I, as I said, this is just a preliminary sort of trying to get the lay of the land a little bit. Yeah. If, if there is, I mean, if 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 I came before you and and you basically said no, you can't touch that, 
then you know uh, yeah. we would leave it alone and and figure out something else that we could do. I mean, we'd really hate to get into a position. I know what you know. I, I don't. I have the copy of all the site plans at home, um, and I know at some point you know we could potentially put a fence around it, but we don't want to do that either. I mean, that's just you know sort of defeats the purpose of having a nice area out in front of us. So we'll have to see what restrictions there might be in the plan, but um, we could brainstorm some possible solutions tonight. One thing that I was thinking of was maybe uh, an observation deck that, um, you know, would, I mean, being permanent wouldn't require constant maintenance. It wouldn't be, uh, uh, it wouldn't provide a, a panoramic view of the pond, but it would provide some visibility in there for safety reasons, depending on how wide the uh, the deck was, um, and then cutting on one side is another option. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can see the uh, idea that uh, that we turned off my mic. Um, you know, like leaving the back 50, 60 percent completely intact and taking the front down, but not. You know, and I'm, I'm not, that's why I was curious if you considered the methods, you know, how you, how you would do that without maybe tromping around in there and disturbing it too much. But there's, you know, brush saws and things like that that might work. But, you know, lowering that front end to some set, you know, minimum that, that we, everybody was comfortable with, I think that that might be something that makes sense. You know. uh, I, th I think we'd be fine with that, you know, really. Uh, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but, you know, I think we'd be fine with that. And another method um, that wouldn't require um, annual maintenance would be to replace some of those reeds with um, short shrubs or something that would prevent them from. Uh, we could certainly do. Yeah, you know, we could certainly do do that too if that would would be your recommendation. You know, obviously, that wouldn't happen this year, and we're not in a rush. I mean, uh, I we happened to be talking about this at our quarterly meeting yesterday. And when I looked at your schedule, I saw there was a meeting tonight. So I said, okay, let's, I'll jump right in and get started anyhow. So, well, part of, part of the um, purpose of the conservation subdivision, and I don't remember for sure uh, with, this, with this one, but generally the, the way that the subdivision um, ordinance is written is that um, it's there partly for the enjoyment of the public. So. You know, if you can see the pond, that's uh, a little bit of a better benefit. Yeah. So it's it's in keeping with um, with the ordinance. I, w I would think we'd have to look at the plan specifically. Okay. Yeah, I remember this one pretty well. There's a, a section of wetland and wetland buffer on the Dover side of the property that was put into conservation, and this center section had the created pond to mitigate some impact on that side, if I'm remembering this one right. Um, I don't remember what the wording was, but I'm sure it was something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I don't believe this was a um, conservation subdivision. It's a condo subdivision. Mm -hmm. These are the still, it's the one off, it's the private yeah. road. Yes. There was a good bit of land put into conservation. Was department. there? Okay. I miss, I wasn't aware of that part. Yeah, I'm pretty sure was. because the, the lots are very small. The houses are close together. They're yeah, they're townhouses. Yeah, so yeah. they're all, it, it's common land all owned. They only own their house structures. Right. Yeah. There's a horseshoe yeah. of condos around the outside and then two detached condos. Yeah. It connects to Turgeon. Well, we'll have to see all the. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can pull some stuff too to distribute for the board as well. Okay. okay. We have. So, uh, yeah. Can we get you on the agenda for next month? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Do you need anything else from me at this point? Feel free to contact us in the meantime if you have okay. any other ideas. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right. There being no conditional use permit requests, the next order of business is new business. Item A of which is Land Use and Natural Resources Master Plan Chapter Workshop with Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> so tonight, um, I wanted to go over with you all the plan for the community workshop to be held on May 2nd. Um, 
So what you have in front of you is an agenda outline, and I can go through each of the activities and explain what that will look like. Um, and then I will be looking for a couple of volunteers to help do some note taking. <laughs> so um, this is planned for May 2nd to start at 6 p.m. in the council chambers. And we'd like to start off with just a sign in and entry exercise. So we'll have participants, um, first we'll have them register beforehand so we can kind of track who, how many people will be attending. Um, so I will get those materials, sort of marketing materials distributed to Summersworth staff later this week. Um, and so then we'll have folks sign in as they come in and then we'll have a question on a poster board that says what are the first five words that come to mind when you think of what Summersworth should look like in the next 10 years, just to get people thinking. Um, and then we'll do a quick introduction and presentation and we'll ask that either Scott or another member of the board um, introduce or welcome participants, explain why the forum is taking place and kind of what this process is, um, and then introduce SRPC and we can present on some existing land use and natural resource data. Um, we're releasing our data snapshot next week so we'll have all new census data and things like that which will be great. Um, and then we'll talk about the 2020 master plan vision and then just some goals of the workshop. And then I have two larger activities planned. The first of which is a visual preference survey and you can see an example of what that would look like on the second page. This is one that we did in Stratford, just a portion of it. Um, it would have several other sort of place types uh, included in that and that kind of speaks to the different land use types and what people actually want those buildings and spaces to look like. Um, some other examples of these include uh, mixed use buildings, community center, um, parks, and different things like that. So we would first ask participants to place sticky dots under the images that they like the most for each place type. Um, and then the next part we would ask, um, we'd have the group sort of prioritize those items with the most collective yeses, which of these places would enhance summer's worth the most, where should the city focus its resources when it comes to these different place types, um, and then we'll have participants sort of rank those with sticky notes. And then part three of that, we would have a land use map or just a general base map. Um, and then we'll have people place sticky dots that are color coordinated with each of those place types and where they'd like to see them in the city. Um, and that's really fun because then after that we can sort of turn that into a new map of, of what, uh, what these different land use types might look like and that will support another activity later on <coughs> with the planning board to create that future land use map. So that's the first activity. And then the second activity um, is another mapping exercise where we would have um, a map that has your conservation lands pointed out. And um, also we can include community features, the community features data layer, which indicates where churches are and community centers, library, things like that. And we'll ask participants to use sticky notes to name the places that are the most special or memorable to them in Summersworth. And then the second part of that, we'll have a facilitator identify where those commonalities are on the map and asking why these places are so special and potentially are there any challenges or opportunities that exist there. And that kind of speaks to what pieces of Summersworth are we trying to preserve uh, as we go into the future. So after that, we just have a few closing remarks, uh, thank participants and give them a brief overview of the next steps. And we also have just a short evaluation survey to see uh, if participants felt they were engaged in an effective way um, so that we can sort of adjust for the next workshop later on in the fall focused on implementation and really uh, generating community support and volunteers to actually implement the action items. 
So that is the outline. Um, does anyone have any initial comments or reactions to that? I have a question. Sure. So um, the process activity one, um, are you going to have the city partitioned where, you know, the, the different um, like ice cream shops, uh, restaurants, and all can go, or is, is that just going to be a generic map of the city? Yeah, so in um, when I've done this activity before in other communities, um, I've done it in the smaller communities where there aren't as many zones, so they've kind of circled out those areas that they might rezone, whereas for you, um, we could use a zoning map. Um, I think that is that is definitely a question. It's up to you what you think. I think a, a feature map would also work, you know, like identifying conservation lands um, and sort of where the businesses are and where residential is. Um, if we don't want it to be, you know, focus on the current zoning, but. Our zoning overlay is very busy. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, we could just circle like this is where the downtown is. These are where your prominent, you know, parks and things are. Um, it feels like there should be a backdrop to, you know, that limits some of this. So we don't just, like, who wouldn't want an ice cream shop next to a trail, you know, mm. pushing things out. But if there could be, and, I, and I'm not familiar enough with what, what data exists for that and zoning and all, but, but maybe picking some of the, um, you know, for lack of a better word, the more urbanized areas where businesses might Know, be able to go instead of just having the whole open footprint of the of the city be a good idea along those lines something we talked about on planning board a lot is appearance standards it's one of our most common waiver requests and where we've kind of gravitated out to on that is that there's really three chunks of the city with very different appearance standards that have kind of grown organically there's the downtown area that's the old New England mill town sort of look then we've got the miracle mile up uh, route 9 the Walmart Home Depot target area which is very much modern commercial and then 108 which is kind of gravitating towards this medical office uh, light industrial sort of thing um, all three of those get a ton of traffic so if you're looking at visual there's really three sections where people may want entirely different things and where something would look really out of place and one that would fit perfectly in another it might help to uh, to know what the um, what we're attempting to glean from from this. It, is any of the um, are we are we asking people whether they're interested in rezoning at all? No, I don't. I definitely don't think we want to get that specific. I think it's more of um, you know one activity is to see what features in town people want to keep and people cherish the most and then the visual preference is really to see you know what is potentially lacking um, and again what fits with existing land use types but still leave some room for you know this area might not be zoned for this particular thing but maybe it is that you know a lot of residents do want a restaurant or a cafe option near a place where they recreate um, so, so. Uh, practically, what are we doing with that data that we're collecting? So the visual preference survey activity, we've turned those into maps before where it's not necessarily a rezoned, like rezoning map, um, but indicating those new features like here is where a cafe is desired, here is where a community center is desired, here is where a farmer's market is desired. Um, so I think that information is helpful when it comes to thinking about your ordinances um, and policy measures, and then <clears throat> where those discrepancies exist in potentially doing like an ordinance audit after that. Um, and then the, yeah, so I think that the two things we're trying to glean here are what do we have that we cherish the most and what um, features do we want to see in the future and does that match with policy measures and that's kind of comes on our end of the analysis after we get the information is okay where where do those discrepancies lie and what recommendations can we provide uh, at the end and and I'll also note um, 
in May, we'll start putting together a community survey we, where we can really get more granular with our asks to the community about do you, uh, do you recreate at these specific conservation spaces? Um, do you support regulatory measures to um, protect drinking water and different things like that? How, how do you recreate there? Yeah, yeah. So there, there'll be much more um, expansive opportunity, I guess, in the survey to ask those kinds of questions. What sort of outreach is there for, um, to get people to the meeting? So I was planning on putting together um, by the end of this week to send over to Summersworth staff. Um, typically, I'll do a flyer with a QR code and registration link. Um, so people can register for the event and that will give us their email so that we can reach out, you know, a week before, a day before and say, hey, reminder, you know, please come <laughs> to this event that you registered for. Um, and typically we would send those out in physical forms at, you know, your libraries and your, your municipal um, buildings. And then we would have it posted on local Facebook pages that we have access to. And then also your... Um, city website and city newsletter and then also our SRPC's e-communications. Might be able to get it in um, uh, nature groupy. That's a good thought. I, yeah. What's your turnout been in other towns? So thus far um, recently we had a workshop in Newmarket um, for their master plan in March, and we had about 40 attendees. We had one in Lee last night um, where there were 30 attendees. And then I believe for your housing chapter last fall, there, it was about 50 or so attendees. Um, so I think between that 25 and 50 range is expected. Um, typically, natural resources is a bit lesser turnout, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's Thanks. Okay. And we'll mention it at various board meetings too. So for all of the people watching at home, they can hopefully hear it as well. About the water bill thing. I think we missed um, our it. chance for the, it has been, a, I think it was mentioned at the workshop last um, month or so too, that that was a productive way. I don't know that we would be able to time it to hit when Allison's going to send out the next round of bills. Um, it takes a while for us to print everything, too. Yeah. So um, I guess my, my only other question for you would be, is anyone willing to note take at the event? <laughs> So that's a yes from you. That is a yes. <laughs> I'll be there. Great. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. I'll take notes. Uh -huh. And we can help too. Okay. Staff wise. Great. Great. Yeah. So I will um, get the marketing materials out to you all and I'll, I'll CC you, Scott. Um, and I'd be happy to reach out to Na Nature Groupie as well. I have some friends there. So I can do that. If anybody knows anybody in the school system that could help spread that information yeah. that way that too. Coming back to that, is there? I mean, is it? If Angela is in, uh, well, <laughs> is it? Um, is it feasible to send like a flyer out with to students, or we can at least inquire it, about it if it's. We can ask if that's an. Um, if there is allowances for that or if there is restrictions, obviously, right. that I would assume that they would allow us at least to post it in places at the school, um, whether or not it's something that we're able to disseminate through the school, I'd say we'd have to inquire through those channels. Yeah, I can talk to Michelle to see if that's something we can look into. Something that was successful in Newmarket, um, they advertised at the their PTA meeting, so that might be something um, we could do as well. 
Alright. So something on the on Facebook. Yep, we can coordinate with Jenny about that, ask her to share that. Um the lib I don't know when the library's newsletter goes out either, but um they could ask them to put that on their website, uh their Facebook as well. Just different channels. Some people may participate with those ones more often than our general one. Has the library finished their that series they were doing? I was just thinking about that there's a there's like a pollinator talk or something in a couple weeks. I yeah, think. they were so the library was doing like a natural resources program series, um, I think. Master Gardener. Yeah, so on the 16th, there's a pollinator gardens. If we're able, we could potentially advertise at that because that could get um, targeted. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. So we've got Nature Groupie, various town outlets, um, library, Facebook. Um, and I'll outline all of these when I reach out to you all, Dana mm -hmm. and Scott, um, later this week. So, and then hopefully we can start publicizing next week and um, generating some registration. Um, and then, so the focus this month is really setting up that workshop. Um, and then in May, <coughs> I'd like to come back to you all um, and we'll have a more consolidated set of goals. Um, I've been working through all the materials from our last couple workshops and the progress updates on the last few, um, the assessment and the master plan. Um, that's a lot of information to synthesize, but I think we have a really good start on both goals and strategies. Um, so I'd like to come back to review that with you all and then <clears throat> also review an updated map set because um, we had a lot of suggestions for new maps, so Jackson's working on that this month, our mapper. Um, and then we'll start talking about questions for the community survey. So that is the plan. Is there any question, any other questions you have for me? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Have a good night. Okay, the next item is application for technical assistance from Taking Action for Wildlife. Uh, Mr. Degler had sent a, an email, um, which I forwarded to the commission. I don't know if you had a chance to check your email yet, but. Um, there's an opportunity to get assistance from one or two staff members uh, under taking action for wildlife for um, technical projects. Um, and some that I, that I flagged from their examples were um, Let's see, actually, I've got an email from, from Kevin here. Uh, I'll call his out first. Field restoration. Do um, you mind if I read from that? Oh, no, yeah. No, okay. I, yeah, I can say I, so I was on the webinar. I yep. mean, the setup was you attend the webinar and then you're a member of a conservation Gives you priority. Thank you. I don't do a really bad job of mic control today. Um, it gives you priority over uh, other people that may be going for these pro these grants as well. And so um, there was four different different webinars: uh, community conservation for wildlife, um, land use planning for wildlife, wetlands for wildlife, town lands for wildlife, um, and then there's a you know pretty detailed web page that. Uh, has a list of you know potential projects or past projects and I think that's what Scott you, that you cut from and sent around and so it's pretty open um, I certainly was attending with um, 
thoughts of Mallee Farm, but that's just, you know, there, there can be a trail component, there can be field restoration, there's stream, there's pond, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things, but invasive species at other sites, um, you know, getting input on uh, wildlife management plans on other townlands or whatever could all be play. The, what I started kind of focusing on as an option was, uh, you know, there's that big field at Maui Farm that's just, you know, I feel like it's at a crit it's sort of at a critical point, you know, where it's going to fall apart soon if, if, and, and be a lot harder to do, to do any type of restoration than if we start sooner. And, and so after In terms that, of ch the change of character of the habitat absolutely yeah. yeah you know and and you when you're out there on like wet years you know you see milkweed and there there's still like native species fighting but um it could easily melt down pretty quick i think um so i reached out to one of the unh extension folks after uh, after the last seminar and we're gonna meet next week just to look at the site you know and then that would potentially be an avenue into a project or not. I mean, and if we all thought as a group that, you know, there's a better project to do, that's fine too. But I, I at least wanted to make that contact after the webinar. And so, um, so it seemed, they seem like good opportunities, you know, where you might end up with a team of people, you know, uh, one or two people or more to help out, you know, to, to design a project, assess a project, you know, rehab area or something like that. So that's my take on it anyways. So um, is, are you thinking maybe um, helping with the creation of a wildlife uh, management plan and then, and then following through on maintenance of it or, or just doing a, a one-time maintenance? So, it, I mean, if, if it was, if Mallee Farms was the focus and the field was the focus, I think just, you know, that's that's not an area of expertise I think we have on the panel, kind of, or on the commission. So having some insight from other folks on, on you know, mowing schedules, um, what type of equipment would be appropriate, you know? So yeah, I guess I hadn't looked at it as, in terms of a, as a wildlife management plan, but you're right, that's a great point. It it's essentially is, but for probably geared towards um, pollinators and, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that's a great way to frame it, really. Um, and just having, you know, I think we could all piece it together, you know, what would be the best approaches, but having another set of um, folks out there would be really beneficial. And I think the nice thing about the field is it goes down to the stream and up to the beaver pond <laughs> or the dam, you know, and so potentially, I don't know how, you know, we, we want to be careful on any type of grant thing like this where we don't get too broad, but there may be a way to touch on several ecosystems in one even if it was just field to riparian buffer and the riparian buffer is in dire condition in my opinion there too mm -hmm. so um yeah i i feel like it would it would be a good project um and something along those lines a while essentially a habitat management plan um focused at pollinators small game probably would fit into that um I don't, you guys didn't do any releases of cottontail there, but you did them across Mallee Farm, right? Is that, is that considered habitat for? No, it was done on Mallee Farm. I, yeah, but not, on, not in the, uh, in the field. Yeah, on across Mallee Farm Road, right? Yes. Yeah. Do you have, do you know if they've been tracked into the, the field at all? Uh, they, they haven't, okay. you know, the, the, New England cottontails don't venture out from the, the dense brush, so. Okay, so it's too open. Yeah. But they're still there. Yeah, and, sure. And they keep releasing. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that so that's one idea, and and again, that's you know, there's there's other avenues to go. Um, do you, do you have um, a sense of the nature of the assistance? You, you mentioned the word grant. Uh, the way I was reading it, it was it was just getting a couple people to help yeah. us. No, I think that's a good point. It it I think it positions us to get 
to be more competitive for grants, um, especially so like if we went that avenue towards rehabbing the field, there's then the, the fish and game small grant program. And they specifically talk about early success in all habitat, mowing, um, you know, so so it would, I think it would set us up really well, you know, to, to build off of for money. This, I think, would be um, just getting people's energy, you know, and getting their help and, and which would be hugely beneficial, um, even if if we did the heavy lifting of writing a plan, but to have it, you know, essentially peer reviewed or whatever by two or three wildlife biologists. Um, so that's a great point. It is, I, I don't anticipate it coming with any type of funding, but it, but I do think it would position us well um, to be able to go forward for funding competitively. Okay. So a, a couple other ideas um, that were uh, in the examples were uh, identifying vernal pools on town or city owned land. Um, road crossings, I think we have a, a pretty good handle on where we're going with that. Well, um, conserving town lands through conservation easement, you know, that's already in, in play. So we definitely could use help with that. Um, so it's a matter of um, prioritizing where we want to. We, we do. We have to do the natural resources inventory as well. But I think that probably we know what you know what we need to do for those. Yeah, and then I mean, if there's another city property that you know, tra there's the there's help with you know trails, um, you know, invasive species management on a property. Right. Yeah. Did I, surprised I didn't put that down here. And then um, community observations of wildlife sightings, but um, you may have you may have the most urgent project because that you know the monarchs are suffering and that's a huge place for them it, it i will say it's and i'm trying to be unbiased you know because i've been spending so much time working on that lake farm but it we can tell the most complete story um at mallee farm right like we have uh you know considering trails we are you know um, moving towards conservation uh, we're considering wildlife habitat you know it's it's kind of an easy story to tell of and then you know what's clear too in talking to extension folks especially is they know the legacy of like what you've been involved with what Angela's done um, it constantly gets brought up, you know, and so, the, you know, we have that to work off of as well. And I think that that's a huge benefit, you know, so there is a history of success and then like everybody's behind what we're trying to do there, you know, that I've, that I've a interacted with. So, um, you know, the field, I, I feel like the conservation easement you know, as we know it right now is, you know, that upland, the forest and, and the stream and the, um, the river corridor there, uh, but doesn't necessarily include the field, you know, and the field could be managed as part of that or separate if, if, if it couldn't all be wrapped together, you know. Mr. Breyer, any ideas? For, um, you know, I assume that we're going to apply for this. Um, it doesn't look like a painful application, but um, regarding what to to apply for, when you say what to apply for, well, of those examples, like um, oh. uh, you know, assistance looking at preserving the, the nature of the Mallee farm fields, um, looking at, um, you know, potential city land that could be conserved, 
Um, yeah, well, I guess I'm thinking like Nally Farm, where it isn't really a conservation land by the city yet. You kill two birds with one stone. Uh, I think Kevin's project is probably one of the biggest things that can be done for this city uh, that would have a major impact. Mm. We can open up that whole other section of Nally Farm to foot traffic and even down along the river and, and make that more accessible. I think that's a huge accomplishment for the city. Um, like I, I say, I think that is probably the biggest project that we should look at at this time. Mr. Rhodes, you're nodding. Is it? I think we've got a combination of a complete story that we can tell about the property, a large open expanse of land, a section of habitat that's in jeopardy, and an opportunity to do a lot there. So if there's a better opportunity in the city, I'd, I'd be very, very surprised. What might also be interesting on that piece of land is, is to, if it's not done already, to document the history of that land. Yes. What was it? Yeah. You know, you know who was there? Yeah, I think um, Jenny Holmes has a, a good history of it. It yeah. does have a, there, there's a unique history there to some of, and I won't remember the names now, but I went down to the museum to dig around for old maps and talk to some folks there, but there's this weird connection between the family that had it before, there's a woman that, that owned the farm before Mally, Mally Farm existed, and she became some kind of like international hero in in one of the Eastern Bloc countries, wow. <laughs> and so there. And then a couple, maybe now like five or six or seven years ago, a group of um, I don't know if it was Estonia. Or I, I can't remember all the details. I have this already, but they like came over here because she's a, she's like a cultural wow. hero. She moved over to that country with her husband and and was like shipping U.S. products in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it was, I, I thought I was just, you know, I was really just hoping for a map of, you know, <laughs> from like 1920s or something and an understanding of the Mali name, but it's, the story really, I think, is about that family that held the property for generations before that. So, um, yeah, and that's just the European, you know, that's, that's the European history. And, and so there, there's certainly more to a site like that from going back. So, I mean, another aside from that, but in the same vein, is the city of Summersworth, you don't see very many historical markers in this town. For one of the properties being developed, or soon to be redeveloped, is the bleacher, uh, the bleach factory on Main Street. Uh, Jim Burke. Jim Burke. I mean, that apparently is a pretty historic building. Oh, the mill yeah. building? Yeah. Never hear anything about them. So I mean, maybe that's something in the future is maybe put up some historical signs as to what went on in Summersburg. Yep. Mr. Collins. Oh, I just mentioned. I think the only thing I know about the Bleach Tree, famous wise, is Stephen King work there. Oh really? That's all. Yeah, it's in it's in the the, the uh, museum. His book, uh, Night Shift, is based on his time living there and working there. Well, that's on my that's my <laughs> to read list then. Wow. Maybe that explains things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so um Kevin, would you be interested in filling out the application or Yeah, it I don't think it's um I don't think it's going to be too demanding. It's more of it's just awkward, you know, because really it's built to be submitted online, like written and then submitted. But I pulled everything out, um, regardless of what project we were going to go for. So I, I was thinking, you know, what the best approach would be to, to write it, you know, as a document and then share it, you know, and um, for comments. You know, it's a quick. Yeah, it's crazy that it's already almost mid-April, but uh, I think the the due date is May you know, 1st. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with giving you leeway. So I, I appreciate that. I would, <laughs> but I would just like, I, I would like to run it, have other sets of eyes on, mm -hmm. on it, you know. So how about this? I will 
I, I have some time next week. I'll try to put something together. I'll f can I, if I send it to the entire commission, if you have time to review it, great. If you don't, that's okay too. And I'll put a date on there, you know, like when I'll need it back and everything to be able to turn it around. That yeah, sounds just like blind copy everybody so we're not having a conversation. Yeah, okay, blind copy. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any other new business? In that case, old business. Uh, item A is the review of rules of procedure. Um, vice chair is out again, should we just proceed? Um, I've read through the um, the changes, and uh, I have I have no nothing to add or, or remove. Does everyone have a look at it? Have there been revisions from the last time we looked at it? Right. So, I mean, I, I was comfortable with how it read before. Not since like January. Yeah, we tabled this a couple of times because we didn't have the members. Okay. So, uh, would anyone entertain a motion to approve the, the new rules of procedure? I move to accept them as currently written. Second. Yeah, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Easement monitoring. I'm sorry. Uh, review of the recommended native tree list uh, proposed revisions. So we've got our two foresters here. So you know, I, I don't know that I have further comments on what we talked about, you know, before of, I mean, since it's a recommended tree list from the city, I just, I, I don't, don't really see the need to have exotics on there. Um, so, you know, that that's still where I'm at. And, and I think if, if we want to increase the um, available, you know, species, then we start thinking about the assisted migration and you know, some of the some of the tree species that maybe would have been avoided ten years ago up here. You know, southern New England, uh, a few tree species there. There's probably varieties which you know I'm not completely up on, um, but that may be a way to supplement it uh, mm -hmm. as a as a you know I don't want to say a trade off, but you know just to add some other options to folks. But I don't know. You know, I just don't see the need to have exotics in, you know, in a, in a recommended um, tree list from us, or, you know, from the city. So, along that vein, um, there are some on there already. There's the Pagoda Dogwood, Fleshy yep. Hawthorn. Um, I'm not I mean, sure there's a else. fair bit on here. And, and some of them, you know, I mean, there are there are native options. Um, you know, the European hornbeams on here. Yeah, well, it's hard to see this. It's shaded. To give an idea of how this is used, we pretty frequently push developers towards this when they're drawing up landscape plans for new projects in the city. So if it's on here, we're telling them it's what we want. Yeah, and that's kind of what I what I've been leaning into. Uh, you know, Jeremy, is that this is a list that. You know, we would like to see, so I, I think in a way we should be conservative with it. You know. So should we, should we just strike the exotics from here? That was my opinion as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd add in terms of assisted migration trees, given the zone? I, 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 my comments were similar to last time in the sense that I, I agree with Kevin. Um, assisted migration is, is important, uh, but in terms of uh, anything not native, I, I don't see the reason. Okay. Yeah, so we, I, I'm waiting to hear back from a few folks, but, you know, we could potentially put, I don't know if, if maybe it would be too 
confusing to have an addendum to this or, or maybe we edit it later and, and have you know kind of a, a section broken out um, as species to consider that are a little bit more southern you know or southern New England um, yeah I'm not sure I'm not sure we can do it in phases because this is part of the uh, the tree ordinance yeah yeah um, you know we, not, could, we not, could groom it and then present it I mean, if 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 we if it's important to get this done now, I I think you know a reassessment in you know five years or something would would probably be okay, and that's where we could add to mm -hmm. it, you know. And if we want to, um, I mean, I think we can clear clearly make you know a, a rational or a logical um, decision on on why why we would not want to have exotics on here, and we just go for it with that. See how things play out um, down the line, and add you know assistant migration or not you know in the future. Um, that might be something that we could actually build into the um, the ordinance a five year reassessment. <clears throat> <Yeah. Yep. clears throat> um, <clears throat> so we I think we need to <clears throat> excuse me alter this list <clears throat> and um, and get approval from the commission on um, yay or nay, you know. Uh -huh. uh, if somebody's um, expert on uh, identifying what's exotic and what's not, um, they can cross those off. I mean, I went through, I didn't get into the small trees because that's where it gets more confusing to me. Um, but I could do, I could, you know, dig around. I went through large trees and just, mm -hmm. you know, crossed out. Um, I don't know if you want to hear them now or. I don't see why not. Okay. So um, large trees greater than 45 feet. Um, and see, in a way, uh, assisted migration has already worked into this, you know? I mean, like, there's uh, river birch, and, you know, there's some species that are going to benefit for warmer climates. But so Carpinus betulus, European hornbean, would be gone. Um, the Katsura tree, ginkgo, <coughs> European larch. We have options for that. Um, see, an American sweet gum's a, a species that would be recommended <coughs> for um, assisted migration. So, in a way, I think that is, and same with um, tulip tree and and cuber, uh, cucumber tree magnolia. So, those are all good. Uh, Dawn redwood. Uh, I also xed out London plane tree. Can't remember where. Are you looking at the the ordinance? I'm looking at what you was provided the when we started discussing this. Oh, had the, the same packet. I think that was um, what um, code enforcement officer had had floated. Oh, I thought this is what we were working off of because <clears throat> this was going to be the replacement or was hoped to be. Well, there are a lot. You know, aside from exotics, there are a lot of other additional trees on on that list from what's on the ordinance. The ordinance is. Maybe a couple dozen large oh. trees. Well, that would have been a lot easier to do. <laughs> okay. Um, so is so is this this is not under consideration anymore? So that was what we are still looking for feedback on, yeah. and I think that because the list is small, that's one of the things that Shane was thinking is that what we get feedback from from people is that what's on the list those types of trees those are hard for them to find mm -hmm. they have trouble sourcing them and things like that so i think that one of the things that shane was getting to is expanding that list to have more options for these people as well that they're able to get um from the list and things like that so if we can strike all the exotics and and merge the two lists So, can I grab a copy of that after the meeting? And I can share it with Jeremy too for the minutes if that's helpful. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I know that this is kind of dragged out, but if we wanted to 
um, like I, I can look at both lists and do a combo thing and then we would revisit it next meeting. Oh, that's fine with me. I, I, okay. I didn't know. It just feels like this is <coughs> on the agenda for a little while, but why don't we do that and then we'll have a, so I, I'm, I apologize. I didn't understand that we, I, I thought we were just working off of this and this was the new list. No, I mean, we, we need to merge them somehow. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can take a crack at that and send it. So okay, great. Okay. Thank you. And yeah. uh, Mr. Rhodes, you were talking about um, the desire to, I think you may have ordered, uh, ordered like putting more teeth into it. <clears throat> Potentially. Right now it shows up as a recommendation. We can push back on landscape plans if they come in, but if we can do something to try to prevent people from planting exotics. I th I think there's two different lists too in kind of conversation. So the site plans have site plan regs has a list. Mm -hmm. And then right now I think we're talking about the tree ordinance list, which is regards to like city street trees, mm -hmm. city properties and things like that. Yep. So would the intent of the commission be looking for that these lists are um the same or would there be a specific so Shane's list is in consideration for city street trees and things like that um things that would survive in those areas and so would the commission be looking at this in the lens of we want the tree ordinance list of trees to be the same as the site plan regs one or would there be because obviously there's going to be some differentials for what's going to survive potentially in a more grassy area than like a small sidewalk tree yeah i think it might be a future project to take a look at the the site plan reg ones because where this one is specialized for that one sort of environment uh occurrence we don't necessarily want to tell people that they have to plant just this list there's probably a larger list that's available for a broader array of conditions. Well, um, I think the, the list that um, that was sent out um, has species for a wide variety of, of habitats, you know, not just urban plantings. Um, but I think it could accommodate pretty much any any application. Yeah, my, my kind of thought process here is that the FDA just rezoned large chunks of New Hampshire, including Summersworth. Um, it changes what's appropriate in different environments, and our current regs were based on not only the old zone, but probably an older mode of thinking about what was appropriate to be planted in locations. Um, there's a few species on the current site plan reg list that I think clearly should not be encouraged. Um, so going back and revisiting that, particularly now that we've got folks on the commission who have broad expertise in this area, makes a lot of sense. So um, is it within the purview of the uh, the planning board to change the site plan regulations, or is that? Yeah. Okay. What if we, what if we had a, a joint meeting at some point? Would that yep. be helpful? I think that would be a really good idea. Po possibly a workshop before one of the planning board sessions. Um, I think it is one of our long to-do lists to look, um, staff-wise, to look at the site plan regs. So if there's recommendations, too, from the commission, um, that could be something that in when staff starts looking at those, um, it can be part of the overall um, considerations of what we bring to, to the board. Uh, Michelle has mentioned that she wants to look at those soon, too. We just recently updated subdivision regulations, so the site plan will get the next, um, probably, look over. So would a workshop be helpful for that? I can run it by Michelle to see if that's something that she would like or if she would like the um, opportunity first to start at the staff level yeah. to look at the document before jumping into any joint workshops and things like that. Okay. Um, we are throwing a lot of workshops at you guys right now with uh, master plan stuff so we don't want to burn out everyone as well um, so unless you guys want to move into city hall <laughs> well, for all so the night meetings i guess what i would add too and, and maybe this will delay the another workshop too is i mean if we truly want to be integrative and a little bit um progressive 
you know, we have the plan at least of a tree inventory, and that could provide some teeth in terms of, you know, there'd be science behind why we are pushing certain tree species. And, and even, you know, depending on how that all plays out, flexibility when we reassess each four or five, whatever it would be, to say, okay, we are, you know, we're now out, we're, we're at, we're at, where, gosh, we are at <laughs> where we want to be um, in terms of the distribution of, of um, species and genera and families, that ratio that's really important uh, now, but, you know, okay, now things are shifting where we're getting too far into one or two species. So, um, I, you know, that would be a way, like Jeremy, when you mentioned, you know, reassessing the planning guides and, and maybe, like, having some teeth behind it, I think that that would be a way to do that, you know, where we would really be saying, this is our urban forest, um, and this is why we're looking to, because that, that ratio could even be pushed out to like a developer, right? You know, and say, okay, you've got to keep below 10% on this or 20% on that. So um, something, I, you know, I, I don't know how far out we're, we are until we would have, you know, all of those data in and everything. But I think we can, we can make a first pass at the tree list and then think down the road of, like, of integrating. All right, so yeah, we'll, we'll look at the list. You you will look at the list. Yeah. And um, okay, great. And then we'll we'll get feedback on that and and wait to hear from from you regarding a workshop. And then in the back of my mind, I'll keep that idea of uh, changing the ordinance to revisit it every five years. Great, thank you. Um, easement monitoring, I've done none. Um, really got to get a jump on it. But, you know, like uh, Ms. Crosley said, we've got a lot on our plate right now. So, if, you, uh, if you're interested, jump right in. I've got all the documents that you need. Correspondence regarding old business. Um, Mr. Breyer and I met regarding the, the tree inventory. I guess this could fall under correspondence-ish. Um, and came up with some ideas of how to, um, I guess that's, that's jumping into, um, member items, but yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it then. Um, so member items, subcommittee <laughs> items and reports. Wildlife management plan for Lily Pond parcel. Don't have anything that that would be another potential use for um, for uh, taking action for wildlife, but I think probably Mallee Farm trumps it. Um, exploration of formal conservation of Mallee Farm city parcel. Uh, Kevin, you did reach out to Michelle and. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were still on invasive plants. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I, I skipped right over that. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing regarding invasives. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there is, some, you know, I, I, I won't rehash what we've already talked about, obviously. Um, so site visit with, to talk about the fields, but also now, uh, site visit the next week with Southeast Land Trust is going to visit, um, which is exciting. I, you know, I feel like we're we're we're, we're moving slowly where we want to be. Um, Scott and I met with um, Mayor Girding last month, I think it was. Talked about um, you know potentially adding some buffer sections to some of the uh, essentially to the the polygon of, of what is Mallee Farm, and that may involve the field as well. Uh, and so... So including um, a, a, a neck or peninsula of, of, the, um, of the parcel stretching toward the, the treatment plant along the river. Yeah. It really... Scott brought it up. It makes a lot of sense that, it, you know, it just it fits it perfect. Um, 
it seemed like from I heard back from Michelle today and that that wouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, we also talked about optioning in uh, some of the New England cottontail habitat as well. And so uh, we've got to try to figure out, you know, what the boundaries would be. But, but again, like this all ties in really well with CELT too because um, they work closely with Fish and Game. Fish and Game is concerned about the the, uh, not concerned, but it's a high value habitat to them. Uh, so I think on the 24th, when we have the site visit with CELT, uh, Fish and Game's gonna be there as well. So we'll get to talk through the project. You know, there's, I think there's gonna be a lot of knowledge from other folks there of, of what's going on and why, and, and be able to present a complete story of the site. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, I think, I think that might be it. <laughs> I'm forgetting something, but uh, yeah. So if anybody wants to um, <clears throat> attend on um, the 15th or the 24th. Yeah, either one is fine. I think the, the 20, well, they're both gonna be interesting. So yeah, I, I can, um, I'll just send out an email with BC to everybody with the times and the dates. I'm still waiting to confirm the the 24th, but on Monday the 15th is at uh, I think it's at one. So yeah. I'll I'll send everything out at the parking lot. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I responded to you, Kevin, today. I don't know if you got yep, it. I saw it. I think it was for the 24th. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's there's one the 24th, okay. but there's also one the the 15th is the take. Well, it's not really the taking action for wildlife, but it's yep. the the new extension forester um, to talk about the field and hopefully the riparian area too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so now on to the um, city tree GPS inventory project. So Mr. Breyer and I met and um, talked about um, how to scope this for for Jackson um, so that you know we don't have an astronomical price tag um, and we looked at the, um, the the most densely populated sections of the city residential sections primarily which would inc I, I'm not sure whether we talked about this at the last meeting or not but <clears throat> um, Green Street Union Street and um, Main Street and extending that from the, you know, the, the center of town to um, essentially Indigo Hill Road or even further, further out. Um, there are lots of blocks in between, lots of side streets. Um, <clears throat> we could maybe just um, hold off on those for now in terms of just getting a, an initial data set um, without knocking ourselves out too much. Uh, as well as maybe taking on um, the cemetery and you know using that as a um, a way you know more diverse um, collection of of uh, species to to document uh, and it's it's kind of a high value property. Um, what else? You're, you're going to look at <clears throat> the number of trees on those streets to get a, an idea of how much um, volunteer help we might need. Right. <clears throat> I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of trees on Green Street, Union Street, and Main Street that fall into the right of way. Um, that's why when we spoke, I proposed to maybe do some of the side streets. And even okay. there, I've taken, <clears throat> excuse me, several trips in, onto these streets to see just what's involved. And there's not a lot of trees. I mean, it's very compact. Yeah. Um, Which so is good, too. You know, lack of trees is, is good to have for data right. as well. I mean, it's good and it's bad. <clears throat> nothing for the survey, but there's possibilities there. Right. I don't know if you want me to bring up the 
sidewalk thing? Or, yes, please. Um, one of the things that I found on going up and down these side streets was a lot of them, well, most of the, the sidewalks in Summersworth, I shouldn't say most in generalization, but are in pretty bad shape. Um, I know there's a project to redo them that is going on. I mean, I've seen some work on High Street that's been done. Uh, a lot of this, the urban streets, the cross streets off of these three, have sidewalks on both sides of the streets. There's no trees, but there's sidewalks, and I mean, there's very little space to plant in there. But I sent Michelle Mears a email and said, is there a requirement or some type of a city ordinance that you had to have sidewalks on both sides of the street? If not, why can't we rip up one sidewalk on one side of the street, recover anywhere from five to seven feet of land, and maybe plant some trees and kind of upgrade those neighborhoods? Um, and she wrote back and said it's a good question because she doesn't think there is any ordinance. So, and I guess there has been discussion with uh, DPW. They asked the same question: Why do we have to have them on both sides? So it looks like it might be a no-brainer. Save on maintenance and exactly. I mean, save on paving, save on maintenance, you know, safety. You know. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the other thing I I asked her about was down on Main Street. Um, I, I don't know how to say what section it is, but basically there's a, there's a whole section of Main Street down there. there it's all parking and nobody parks there. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, why can't we take sections out of that parking area, make little islands or whatever, and plant trees down there just to kind of break up the <coughs> yeah, break up the monotony of exactly of the make entire it, building. You know, make it maybe a little <coughs> desirable. Maybe we can get some people, some some businesses into these shops on Main Street that are empty now. And I guess she said there is some kind of a planning, I can't remember what word she used, preliminary design for complete street par projects that is uh, ongoing, I guess. So maybe in incorporating the two into that. So I think um, we should be able to come in well under a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, at least for this portion of it, yes. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, the other thing I, I think we talked about was uh, we already have. Um, I think it's AJ Dupree. I mean, I've never met him, but um, he did uh, Elmhurst. Elmhurst. Idlehurst. Elementary. Idlehurst. I, yeah. I don't know why I keep saying that. But anyway, uh, he has basically done the survey up there. Uh, everything is on a map. I'm not sure where the map is or where it resides. The only thing I didn't see were the tree heights. I mean, he's got pretty much everything else. And even the parking lot down here on Summersworth Plaza, everything has been identified. It's been uh, pinpointed or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, well, if we well, can get that information, we should be able to just dump it into yeah, map. quantified and qualified. Right. It's good, good stuff. So, Low-hanging fruit. Yeah, we can get more people to do that. <laughs> and the other thing was um, that we might be able to um, uh, reach out to uh, the SAU facilities to. I mean, they might be our, our first big customer of the tree inventory database. They're. Um, they're planting some trees uh, at the between the high school and the middle school next, so there's there's movement there, and probably some you know opportunity to to use that sort of data. No, I I love the ideas, you know, the sidewalk uh, planting in other areas, and I think. Right, in a way, right, like, like this is what these types of inventories bring out. You know, you're, yep. you're tromping around looking at these places and like, man, there's a, a tree desert in this yeah. community or whatever. And, and I think, too, it's a good time to think about tree deserts and stuff like that in urban situations because there is yeah. funding out there, too. Um, 
we if we had like science behind our inventory, we'd be in a place. So that it, yeah, that all sounds great. And when residents, if and when residents see us out there working on this, um, you know, it, it, it may bring people into the fold and get people more engaged and um, for sure, you know, maybe improve the quality of, of life in those areas. Maybe it'll encourage some landlords. Yeah. You know. It would be important <clears throat> to be able to back it up logically. There will be people that don't like this plan, you know. Yeah. The plan for creating an inventory, or uh, no, moving some of the parking spaces. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I love the idea. I think it's fantastic, and I think that there's places in the city where there's not enough parking, and places where there's a surplus that no one ever uses. So, mm -hmm. I think just making sure we can articulate the value that we're bringing with these ideas is going to be important because there'll be people that don't follow every detail that immediately hear less yeah, parking. Like, yeah. I completely object. So, we should think of that pre preemptively. That was just a sort of a brainchild of, of the conversation. It. So it's not tight. Yeah. It's not married to the, um, the inventory project. Yeah. But, but like Kevin said, it's something that, you know, those things pop out when you're, when you're doing the inventory. So uh, I guess if you want to get back to me on, you know, how much, how much volunteer Time we would need to do the side streets or yeah I, I guess that's pr the preliminary goal of looking at these streets is to determine just how much is going to be needed we spoke you know originally we were going for the whole city well I mean you know how many people are you, are you going to need we don't want to bring in a hundred people if it turns out we only need 20 so yeah I guess the first thing to do is find out how long it's going to take to do like a sample street and we can kind of estimate what we might need do you, do you have uh, access to the database or this would just be taken taken notes on on paper just uh, I the, I asked God, I, can't remember who I, spoke to. I think it was Jackson when I was talking about uh, having the whole city built into a database and Apparently, the inventory application that they had, he said they got rid of. They get rid of it after it's done. Like for Dover, there's no longer that form. So he would have to build one of those in order to do the survey. So, I mean, maybe at some point we say, yeah, we need that. But I think to do this, I'm just going to do it on paper. And actually, the uh, Liz Durfee that made the presentation. When I spoke to her, she was saying about 50% of the trees that were surveyed in Dover were done on paper. And then she transferred that information into the application. Yeah, so but... Yeah, not having the application is a big deal. Not so much on the... I mean, it'd be nice to have it all going directly in in the field, but that's that's the interface for mapping. Right. Yeah. And, but I mean, any anything that I come up with on on the paper inventory would be put into that application at some point by Jackson or whoever for or us, depending on how difficult it is. No, but I mean, but oh, we would we would need access to right. That. We would have to build a data set within that application that he could download into the app. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's another step, but if I get out there and find out that this is more uh, difficult than I'm imagining, then maybe we would have to go. Have you talked with staff about uh, where this will live on, on a server? I mentioned it, I can't remember, I think it was Amber spoke about who would be maintaining it or, you know, and uh, I spoke to the people in Dover, I think they had one person that was maintaining it and that person left, so now they're trying to get somebody to backfill it and I said well how often is it updated and there hasn't been three years so 
Is there such a thing as a that that sort of server? City Hall that could house a database like that? Um, I don't know how big it is. Like, without knowing like a lot about it, um, like if it's just theoretically, yes, we have like obviously we have our documents and things like that. We can save it if it's not something that's more than like the capacity i guess i don't know enough about our exactly what the program would require for housing if it's just like a document that we're saving obviously yeah we can save that on our servers and things like that um yeah, it wouldn't be huge yeah so probably we could just save it and then it's available if it's something that anyone that like if it is Amber or if it's someone in our department that accesses it, Public Works or us, like we have shared areas that they can either person could get to. I mean, it is more. It's a spatial database. It's not, you know, it's not just putting an Excel sheet somewhere. And so, the the key the key thing to find out, I think, is do we have a GIS person with the city, and do we have a license for Esri software? Yes. And if we do, then life's very much easier. If because we don't, don't that changes don't the whole license. story. You know, you know we you have over Amber, and she said yes, we do have. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. We that have an SBA license. Us to either build the data sheet, you know, that Jackson says he no longer has, or if there's one out there, get well. a hold of it. You know, so we we would just need somebody in the staff. You know within the city that knows, that has access to those products and can build that database. Because then, then, you know, the, the data is not gonna sit here, it's gonna be in the cloud. And, um, and as long as, as the city has that license, then it's protected, you know? Oh, so the, the application has cloud servers? Yeah, I mean, if, if you do it like Dover did it, you know, you'd be able to take data on paper and then enter it if you wanted, but then you'd also be able to have 10 or 15 people out using their smartphones. Okay. All of that data goes in. Um, and then- That'd be a lot easier because they'd maintain it and- That's right. It's have the API to it. Up, yeah. um, and then it's a it's an automatic interface. There's a, um, a GIS version online that you just log into and that's how you make your maps. And, and then you can do a public facing interface that you've talked about here and the, um, who I can't remember her name but the, she went over that day she presented so it's really like you know we need that that Esri license and then to be able to make the um, the database so would that be the city engineer who's the subject matter expert on that or um, most likely I think that if we're asking Amber to, the city engineer Amber to assist in the project that you would need to bring in the public works director amber the city engineer reports to the public works director they are getting into construction season and so that's something to be conscious of there is one city engineer for the whole city so talking with the public works director with any sort of potential impact to projects and workflow that we would be looking for them to assist with would be important communications mm -hmm. um, they keep themselves quite busy okay so I, this would just be exploratory right finding out uh, what's out there and um, and how feasible it would be so we could yeah I would say reach out to, to Mike Babinski and and, uh, and pull Amber in and um, you know, we can talk about whether that's a platform that we can use. And you can still go forward with your timing, you know, the, the, your estimate, you, your determination of how much time you need to put that on paper, and then that gives you that information. But I think the, the whole conversation changes if we don't have a local ESRI, a software license in a way, because then it, we really, you know, updating it changes, um, mapping abilities change. And there may be ways around that that I just don't know, but, you know, finding out that would be 
I mean, like, that's what this map is, right? The, the, um, of the plaza with the, the, um, the different tree species. I mean, they, that's what you want to be able to produce from what we do. And we do have an ESRI license. Yeah, I've seen the bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if uh, this is another situation where you know people like emails better, but it's probably something where a little back and forth conversation might be might speed things up and and uh, rule out some ambiguity so if you if you want to maybe ask if if mike has some time when we can we can meet and talk And if we can um, show that it won't be, it won't be overhead that they need to oh, yeah. um, maintain, then that that would be beneficial. All right, tree replacement at Summersworth Plaza. Any recommendations on that? Diversify. <laughs> No, I mean, I, you know, it, I went through just thinking about options, you know, Hawthorns would be good in there, I think. Um, I'm not sure, are these, so uh, let's see, recommend, recommended to remove, is that based on like health? Like they were falling apart? Kind yes. Of thing and they, Damage and pests. And, yeah, okay. Um, but the plan would be to put something in its place. Would be Correct. Ideally. Yeah. So, you know, Hawthorns, maybe if, if um, again, I don't, I don't know about power lines and stuff there, but um, Winterberry, if we wanted to keep something small. I know Jeremy's got a love for honey locust, but that's okay. <laughs> the locust is the only one that doesn't need to be removed. <laughs> Uh, the very tall well, it does need to be removed. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just that's the only one that's surviving in the plaza. <laughs> I'm not surprised at that. That's why. Um, I mean, you know, there's different, and, and again, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time on urban trees, you know, but there's varieties of hawthorns. They're all pretty tough. Um, you know, maple, scarlet, scarlet oak, maybe, you know, that would be a little bit of a southern New England y thing flavor there. Um, uh, are you considering um, the breadth of the root system? Or I was thinking, on, yeah, I mean, I was thinking a lot about more salt tolerance <coughs> and stuff on there, but um, I thought that there was space. I wasn't as concerned with roots for some reason there. I can't remember if it was because I drove by and there was a larger area than I thought, but but that's, yeah, that would be, I mean, I don't think hawthorns would be a problem with that, but that's a good point for, like, scarlet oak, for yeah. example. Um you know, there's some maple in there. I mean, it would, there's, but there's not a lot. So, you know, supplementing that. Um, the green ash should go and never be. They're gonna. Well, they're dead. It looks like, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So, which makes sense. So that's a couple options. You know, cherries. Yeah. 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 What kind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. What's the um, not fire cherry. What's the. There's one that's very tolerant of salt as well. Um, yeah, we'll have to look it up. I, I can't remember offhand. I'm facing it. But, but, yeah, I mean, and also just not trees, too. I mean, the trees are, like, I mean, winter berries great, you know, yeah. and, and get red berries at the end of the season. They're um, wildlife food. Um, and then they're not crazy, you know. I mean, you have to thin them out, but that's easier than managing a crown. So, I, and that could look really nice along that that sort of avenue there. Yeah. Um, 
We, yeah, we, we would want some shade there, you know, with all that pavement, but mm -hmm. in the interspersing with some shrubbery would be good. Yeah. I think maybe birch, some birch would do all right too. What kind? You know, if you, if you wanted to just stay with sweet or um, paper, paper, I wouldn't do paper. Paper just, yeah, I'd have a rough time there probably, but um, sweet birch would be an option. Can reach out to Sean. Shane. Shane. Sorry. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> All right. Good. I think that covers it, right? All right. Next is the discussion of revision of the recommended tree species of the tree ordinance. I'm not sure why that's still. Forgot to take it off. All right. And any other old business before the commission? I don't have a treasurer's report. Uh, did you get anything? Okay. Didn't think of it. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? Nothing for me. Right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Anyone want to want to adjourn? Go home. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I second. All right. Uh, so motion and a second for adjournment. In favor. Meeting is adjourned at 7.40. You guys are moving.